Hey guys, JC Smith here. Sometimes you just can't get them fixed fast enough. This is a uh, 2004 Mercury Mountaineer. Uh, I bought this thing, I think about three years ago. It had, uh, I think, 80,000 miles on it. No, it had 72,000 miles on it. It was a one owner, uh, pretty decent rig. A little bit of rust here and there because it's Ohio and it didn't get any driven a lot and sat a lot. But um, over the years, I've put all new ball joints in the front and new rotors, new pads, new calipers, all new U joints, rear um, wheel bearings, both sides. Stabilizer links, exhaust, uh, you know, list goes on and on. And uh, the other day I was driving it, I went to go pick up parts, like I use this quite a bit for that, and uh, started to get some grinding noise in the brakes. And uh, this thing sits a good bit, so the rotors, I don't know if that's going to show up, but yeah, you know, they get a lot of rusty scale on them, but the brake pads are just gone. And when I put these tires on, I did the wheel bearings. It's one of those things where it sits so much that you know I did the wheel bearings well over a year ago so those brakes lasted a year and the rotors were cruddy to begin with so I knew I was going to replace them so I didn't bother uh, doing it there because I just don't put enough miles on it. I think it's been three years and I think we're somewhere around 80 let's see here 81,700 so in three or four years I've had it, it's not even, I mean, it's gone, what, what is that, seven, eight thousand miles, not a lot, so, anyway, so today I gotta get this part, and, uh, let's get some new, I'm gonna replace rotors and pads, and we're gonna check out, there's the rust I was talking about, it's got rocker rust too, um, now, my plans for this thing are, if and when the day comes where the body's just too far gone and I don't want to fool with it anymore, this is an all-wheel drive V8. It's a 4.6 V8. So, um, you'll see here there's no four-wheel drive switch. It is full-time four-wheel drive. So, my intentions for this when the body is so bad, it's not, not anything I want to mess with anymore. We're going to take the body off and we're going to put a 1950s Ford F1 cab and short bed on it. Um, we'll just yank the body off and throw it away. Uh, the thing runs good, it's low miles, transmission's good, drive line's good, all that. So um, that's my intent, my uh, plans with it. I'm just waiting to find the body. Once we find the body, I will probably yank that off of there. I don't, you know, I'll be antsy to do it. But anyhow, let me get on these brakes here. You can see how bad those rotors are. Unfortunately, I'm going to put new ones on, and they'll probably look like this in six months. But, uh, man, there ain't nothing left of them. Pads are pretty thin on this side, but the other side is really gone. Um, it's actually down into metal. And it's probably just this one caliper that's bad, but, uh, you know, I can do everything in pairs. I did the rear struts and shocks, oh, probably about six, eight months ago, something like that. It was just, I don't know, it was a nice day in winter when I changed them out because it, it had broken a leaf spring back here, or a coil spring, I mean. So I did that then. We'll get it apart. Well, guys, I got stymied yesterday. I didn't put this in the shop, and uh, it started raining on me. And a friend of mine stopped by. I haven't seen him in a while, and he's chatting with me. And that took up a decent amount of time there. I like to take brake parts cleaner and clean all that rust preventative uh, stuff they put on here. Clean all that off. I use this. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. This is called Johnson's. It's uh, chlorinated brake clean. Anyways, I like to use this stuff. It's very powerful, it's nice and strong, and it's reasonable on the cost. Um, you can't see this, but it's, it's... I don't know what they use on this, but you can't see what it's, it's taking it off. But it, I mean, I barely have to wipe that and it's set up. And then, on the back of my brake pads, 
Well, let me see if I can find it. Let me go grab the stuff I put on the back of these brake pads here. I'll be right back. Okay, so this is what I use in the back of the brake pads. This Napa's disc brake quiet. It's really just like high tech. It's a high tech spray. And really all it does is stops the stops the brake pad from rattling. It kind of makes it stick to the caliper. So when the when the caliper returns, there's no pressure on it. It's not rattling around and all that nonsense, but everybody uses something different, I guess. Use what you like. I don't know if there's one better way than the other or any of that stuff, but yeah, I think I got a little bit of that on my rotor there. A little spray there. Anyways, it makes this really thick uh, adhesive on the back of it, and when you put it into the uh, caliper, it sticks pretty good. Um, I'll show you what I do on the on the brackets where the caliper goes. Um, clean them up and uh, get them ready for pads. So let me get you set up here. All right, you can see how cruddy this is, and that's where the brake pads rest. Let me get these cleaned up here, and we'll get back together. I'm just gonna just kind of talk about a few things while I get this done. Uh, you know, I mentioned that a friend of mine um, stopped by and seen in a while, and uh, we're ta talking for a bit, and he's telling me uh, about what's going on in his life and how unhappy he is. And it all, the, the root of the conversation, or the, the gist of it was, uh, he's working this job making really good money, but it's an hour from home, so he travels two hours driving every day, and, um, you know, he's, he's got a, a beautiful home, and drives a new vehicle, and, you know, he's, his shoes probably cost more than I paid in groceries last month, you know, he's just that kind of guy, he likes the, the latest and greatest, and polar opposites right there um, I don't need anything great um, I can do with a lot less but uh, let me grab a wrench here I'll right back anyways so he's telling me how it works going good and you know he got this this newer job that he just went to and and uh, how things are better and he's making quite a bit more money and all this but you know in the same sentence he's telling me how strapped he is for money and how uh, how much his property taxes are on this house and how much his house payment is and you know it's just him and his wife his kids are out and, you know they don't I don't know I felt I felt like it was all self-inflicted you know it's like he told me his his words to me were lucky and I said I'm lucky well what am I lucky about and he says you don't have to go to work well man I gotta tell you I sure feel like I go to work I get up every morning and I uh, figure out what I'm doing and I get at it and uh, I start about 630 in the morning and I typically quit around 8 30 9 o'clock and well that feels like going to work I'm outside sweating and getting hot and all messy I mean it sure feels like I'm going to work and he says well that's not what I mean what I mean is you don't have to go to a job and I said well you know there's there's two sides to every coin man and it was just funny that he said you're lucky you don't have to go to work and I think what he really meant is that I work from home um, but regardless I mean that's a that can be a double-edged sword too because um, really work never shuts off because you're always at work that, that new bolt and washers in there um, but anyhow conversation goes on and he's 
talking about how unhappy he really is. And, uh, I mean, I've been there. I know what it's like. You know, you got payments, you got worries, you got stress. And he says, man, you're so lucky. You, can, you don't have these things. And I said, you know, I got stress just like everybody else. It's just in different areas. You know, I just don't show it like most people do, I guess. But, I don't know. I gotta grab another wrench. So anyways, he's saying that I don't have stress. Well, I don't think that I don't have stress. I don't think I don't have worries. It's just, uh, you know, mine are different than other people's. And I have my fair share, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, just kind of didn't set well with me. I thought, I don't know what he means by... I don't have any stress. I mean, I got bills to pay just like everybody else, but the difference is, you know, I'm not going out and spending, you know, $200 at a restaurant for dinner, you know, and that's something him and his wife will do, you know, several times a month, you know. And I just don't do that. But uh, it just didn't sit well with me. I just didn't understand his reasoning. Why I'm lucky, you know. It's not like, it's not like I didn't have to work for what I've got. Just like everybody else and everybody watching this, right? We all work for it. You know, we don't take the gravy train. Not interested. You know, there's a thing called self-worth. Make you feel like, you know, you've you paid your own way. And he has. He's worked his whole life. But um, he's that guy that's always chasing the next best thing, the next next get rich scheme. Um, I'm just, you know, I just keep plugging away day by day, and I'm pretty conservative with money. It's nothing for him to, on a whim, jump on a plane and go to Vegas, blow three, four thousand bucks. Well, charge three or four thousand bucks. Uh, He's that guy that works all the overtime because that's what it takes to pay his bills because he's so deep in debt. You know, I think his house is somewhere around, oh, uh, it's probably between four and five hundred thousand dollar house. And uh, I think it's somewhere around, if it isn't over three thousand, it's right at three thousand square feet. And um, it's just him and his wife. The kids, their kids don't have any kids yet. But, uh, I don't know, it just seemed kind of pointless to me. And, uh, I just didn't like the way the conversation went that I was lucky. I don't think I'm lucky. I think I work for what I get. Um, I work a lot. Um, we work. It's nothing special. It's nothing new. It's, it's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get up and go make your money and pay your way and be responsible part of society um i don't know it's kind of irritating to me let's get to the other side so how ironic is that i'm talking about him and my phone rings against him it's just ironic i guess but anyhow i guess what my point was is i don't think i'm lucky you know i I think, I think I work for what I get, you know, and uh, I guess that's, that's the way it should be. Nothing like that at all. Put that sit right. Get back out of there. Come on now. Pull out of there, old girl. Careful now. I guess it's okay. Worth a second to take a look, though. Make sure it's all right. This looked like it was. This looked like it was pushed in the way. There we go. If he can't get his overtime, they can't pay their bills. And I just don't understand that way of thinking. It's like, you know, where did people lose the idea of saving money? Um, I don't want this to be all about money, but I'm going to share something with you is the way I live is everything I do is in thirds when I make money. 
I'll make money in thirds. And what I mean by that is, first off, I've lost my bolt. <clears throat> lost my other bolt. Is it still in the caliper? Yes, it is. Anyways, uh, everything I do is in thirds. So, every bit of money that I make, I separate into thirds. I put one third into long-term savings, I put, which is, you know, things I'm not going to touch. Money that, uh, money that's there for the long haul, you know, catastrophic emergency, uh, you know, things you can't prepare for, and if it's still there when I go to retire, it's a supplement to my retirement. Well, that's one third of what I make, and the other third, or another third, is short-term savings, all right? That's the stuff that I put in there for, you know, like, hey, we want to buy a new refrigerator, we want new living room furniture, or we want want to buy a piece of property or want to um, do some remodeling or whatever that's what that is that's our short term that's stuff that we'll build up and then we'll use some and then once it's down to a, a point that we don't want to go below then kind of pull the reins back and start saving again I don't use credit cards um, I don't even know if they're any good anymore I haven't used them in so long I haven't used them in so long and haven't had a balance that I don't get bills. I don't get a statement for them, so the likeness they're no good, I guess, pretty high. Well, I'm pretty unorganized today. I left my socket over there. But anyhow, I don't, I don't use credit cards. I don't have any loans. I don't have anything great, but I don't owe on it either. And that sometimes is worth its weight in gold, especially in an unsure economy. I wasn't always good with money. Um, I grew up poor. Um, well, I'm going to tell you, I joke about this, but... I tell people all the time I grew up so poor I had to put a candy bar in a layaway. Um, my mom was real sick when I was a kid. She had 14 surgeries by the time I was 13 years old. And uh, back then, a lot of your insurance companies didn't cover a lot of stuff. So I started working about nine years old mowing grass and shoveling snow and you know all the stuff you do as a kid to get a little extra money for a new bike or whatever you wanted something that's what you were working for well in my case it was going for prescriptions and groceries and all that and yeah I don't really care you know, the one thing it did do is it put a very good very strong work ethic, ethic embedded in my grain, and uh, go. It's that side end. We'll crack that bleeder. So I guess it's your childhood kind of forms who you are as an adult. It doesn't dictate who you are, but I guess it lays the groundwork. So a friend of mine starts out with a conversation about how great things are and how much money he's making and all this and before too long it turns into there's no money in the bank if he lost his job he didn't know what he'd do you know that same that same guy was so happy about how much money he was making was certainly in despair very very quickly very shortly through the conversation and he he said he, he wondered how how I got to where I'm at. Well, I don't know. I just keep working. I just keep working. I'm like a squirrel, man. I'm always putting nuts away for the winter. Because you never know when one winter's going to be worse than the last. He's the same guy that last time I saw him was a couple years ago. And I was cutting firewood. And he told me, he says, why do you eat firewood? He said, well, isn't that a lot of work? He 
yeah, it's a lot of work. Sure, it's a lot of work. I said, is it less work having a propane truck come out and drop a thousand bucks every couple months for propane? Think about that. How long are you working for a thousand dollars to buy propane? And how long am I working to cut firewood? kind of fell on deaf ears he didn't quite get it but he was brought up that you know you you went to work and you kept growing through life to get a better job and better job and better job so you can have better better things and that's where he's at he has a beautiful home he has nice new cars he has the latest and greatest clothes and all the latest and greatest electronics and all that kind of stuff and you know that stuff's just not important to me have some decent trucks they're not new but uh, the reality is nothing I have has any real great value to it but I don't know it just kind of hit me just kind of struck a nerve when he said I was lucky because uh, I don't think it has anything to do with luck I think it has to do with being focused on what you're doing and seeing what you want and going after it now just his goals are different than mine. His goals were to have a beautiful home that he could get up a down payment on and he could afford to pay for. Now the house he's in now, he's he's been there two and a half years, three years, something like that. Um, I can't remember what he told me he paid for. It was it was four hundred and something thousand. Now he's forty I think he's 47. I think he's two years older, three years older than me. 47 years old, he took a 30-year mortgage on that. You know, who wants to be in their 70s paying for a house? You know, and there's a lot of people that you could do that because they have the discipline and the drive to pay that mortgage off early. That is not this guy. I'll give you an example. The last house he had, he was five years from paying it off. And he decided he wanted a new boat and he wanted a new truck. So he got a second mortgage on his house and took it right back up to full appraisal value, went and bought a boat and a truck. I mean, the two worst investments in your life. And the other, um, and I think he, he don't even have the boat anymore. Um, somewhere along the lines he sold it. But, uh, you know, and he's that guy that will do something like that. But when he sells the boat or sells the truck, he doesn't pay off the the loan. You know, he keeps paying that payment and takes that cash and goes and plays and throws it away. And He's just not very good with money. And I didn't used to be. I used to. Being all I was telling you, I grew up poor. When I first started getting my own money, man, I was buying everything I wanted. And it wasn't until years and years later that I started treating money like a tool instead of a toy. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, my life changed. I'll give you a, a short story. Um, I went uh, I went one day and I saw this house for sale. And down the road from this house was a house that was coming up for auction. There was a divorce or something going on and uh, the house was going to go up for auction. Well, I got the harebrained idea that I was going to go buy this, I'm going to go to this auction, try and buy this house and pay cash for it. Um, and quite honestly, this isn't something that's new to me. This is kind of a common occurrence. I've done this, not with a house, but I've done it several times with other things. I knew I didn't have enough money to pay for the house, but after talking with the auctioneer and reading the, the flyer about the house, it said we had 45 days to close went to that auction with six thousand dollars in my pocket and uh, they said there was a minimum down payment and I knew that I could I could meet that minimum down payment pretty easy so I thought so anyways I go to the auction and the house is within the number that I wanted to pay so I won the auction I go to put my down payment down and the auctions on a Friday and you have to give them your down payment and um, I took my $6,000 in cash and um, well, it was only part of it. And I told them I'd come to their office Monday morning with the rest of the down payment. And I didn't have it. So 
Saturday and Sunday. Man, I was like a squirrel hunting nuts for the winter. I was doing everything I could to come up with the money. But Monday morning, uh, I was still shy, but it was close. Monday by 2.30, I had all the money. So I went down to their office and I gave them the rest of the deposit. And I had 45 days to come up with the rest of the money. So uh, for the first time in my life, I'm looking at possibly buying a house with no loan. So for 44 days and eight hours, I work like I've never worked before, and I had a truck that I didn't owe any money on. It was, it had some pretty decent value to it, so I sold the truck. My wife's car was paid for, and um, it, it had a pretty good value. And I had another truck to drive. I didn't need that one, so I sold it. My wife needed her car, so I sold a nice car. I bought her one that was um, safe, but you know, not as nice. I took the rest of the money and put it in the bank. Well, I did that with all the things that I had that, you know, I thought I needed, but really, I just wanted. So I sold off all this stuff, and 44, day, 44 days and 8 hours later, I had all the money to pay for the house. That was the beginnings of me living with no payments. Because after that, it just snowballed. You know, it was everything you wanted, you just saved for. Um... And it's just a different, different way of living. Um, you know, of course, I'm not buying, you know, $400,000 houses, but um, my biggest bills are taxes. Property taxes are probably the one that I hate the most, but it is what it is. If you don't want to pay it, get rid of the property. That's the way I see it. So, that's a little backstory on myself. I'm gonna get somebody to help me bleed these brakes. They've dripped blood now. Gravity bled, so I should be able to bleed them out real quick, put this thing back together, and move on to the next thing. Um, got some more stuff coming, so, anyways, I won't bore you with bleeding brakes. You've probably done it a hundred times. But uh, next, we're gonna get the Lincoln back in. All the parts came in. Um, I'm gonna try something on this. A friend of mine, he, uh, he said he's He's used these uh, Standard Ignition products is the name of the company, which Standard Ignition has been around forever. Um, he said they're making cam phasers and variable cam timing um, solenoids. And he's been using them in his shop. He's had really good luck with them. And he's talked me into trying them. So we're going to give him a shot on that Lincoln and see what they turn out to. Uh, he says he gets them off Rock Auto, so that's what I did. So we'll see how well they do. And I'll bring you along because we're going to get that one next. That'll be the next project. We're putting it back together so we can get that sucker out of here and get it sold. This old girl, uh, it's going to be around a while. This, at least till I find a, unless I find a, an, a, a late 40s, early 50s Ford pickup truck body. That's what will go on this. I think that would make a really, really great truck for me. But anyways, all right, guys. You know what to do. If you like what I'm doing, give us these thumbs up. We appreciate it. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and uh, leave your comments down below and we'll catch you on the next one.